my name is Heather Johnson. I'm one of the librarians here with Library 21C, and I'm in charge of Indie Author Day as well as working in adult services. So I'm glad that you're here to join us today. Um, so this is our second panel, and it's our Colorado author panel. So um, we'll be going until 2.15 today, but I'm really happy to present to you our two local authors here. And I do have the bio descriptions. We have Brennan Martin, who comes here from Denver today, made the trip up. And uh, we also have Peg Brantley, who is here as well. So I'll let them tell a little bit about themselves. And um, we'll go through a couple interview questions back and forth. And then at the end, we'll have some time for you to kind of ask your own questions, because I'm sure as ex they've already gone through the process uh, as a self-published writer, so I'm sure you're probably curious to pick their brains and find out a little bit more. So welcome, it's really happy, glad to have you here. I'm gonna kind of step towards the mic a little bit. But if you could tell us a little bit about yourselves. Thank you. Um, I'm a native of Colorado. I used to live in Colorado Springs. Now I live in Aurora. What else? Let's see. I was in corporate America forever, <laughs> for a very long time. And I survived. <laughs> Um, to tell the story, <laughs> to kill people in my books that I really wanted to <laughs> do while I was in corporate America. Um, I. Uh, well, maybe a little bit about your work. I write too. thrillers. I used to think I called them suspense, and um, until somebody said, "No, Peg, you write thrillers," and I said, "Well, what's the difference?" And he said, "The amount of the advance." So that's what, I'm, that's what I'm sticking with, is that I write thrillers. It's nice to be here today. Thank you all for showing up. So uh, my name is Brennan Martin. Yeah, I'm not sure this is on, but you guys let me know if you don't hear me. OK. And uh, I do live in Denver now. I grew up, however, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, somewhat hiding my family business, uh, which was professional wrestling. And I wrote a book uh, about my grandmother and her 50 years behind the scenes of professional wrestling. Teeny. Teeny. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and she, uh, she was a single mother in 1946 who took a second job selling tickets, uh, ended up uh, owning the territory, which is how it worked in the days before the WWF then and now the WWE. And uh, I wanted to um, sort of pay her respect by telling her life story. So... Uh, that's how I became an author. And uh, we actually want to talk a little bit more about that, too, because writers really have their own beginnings and inspirations. So when do you feel like um, you, when you realized you wanted to write, so not just having this inspiration, but you decided, I want to put this on paper, and I want people to know this story. So where does that come from? You go first this time. Well, for me, it came from my wife. Um, she never got the chance uh, to meet my grandmother and uh, just thought she had lived this amazing, interesting, colorful life uh, that people would want to know about. Uh, so she was really my inspiration and, and goaded me enough to, uh, <laughs> to sit down um, and, uh, and write the story. So um, I should say I did write it as a novel, so it's not a strict biography. Um, I gathered stories and, and talked to old wrestlers and talked to family members and sort of pieced the life together and then, and then wrote it in a, more of a novel format. So my goal is to, is to hopefully attract readers who are interested in the story of a strong woman who might not care anything at all about professional wrestling. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. There shouldn't be a live chat category. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, what you find in that section is not, uh, <laughs> I was so disappointed, I went and searched that just recently, actually, and uh, because I wanted to find out what the right category was. I'm trying to figure out how to market the book correctly, and everything I found about single women was single women looking for a husband, yeah. and uh, that just, uh, that was really depressing to me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, we were, if you're just joining us, though, we were talking earlier with um, Emily Gooding and Selfie and really thinking about how do you go to categorize your work when you're going to make your work um, available to people and how would you, um, and I think the term came up, pigeonhole it. And, um, but it can be difficult kind of thinking about how, what is the primary focus of my work and um, 
so I don't know if you can speak about the experience of that, but I, I'd like to ask you too, Peg, how you kind of first came about writing. I was always an avid reader. And so I, um, my bonus son suffered a stroke when he was 39 years old, and we ended up bringing him home um, for, to continue with his rehab. And I was home all day anyway, and I thought, well, you know, I've, I read a lot. Let me try writing a book. How hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, you know, it started with I was home all day. What else was I going to do? I was taking care of a, a, helping take care of a young man who was trying to work his way back to his own life, and I decided to to write. So that's how I started. No, that's great. And you and you talked a little bit about um, how the writing a book <laughs> and how that we think that's going to be an each easy sort of venture. Um, but you know, the creative process really varies for everybody. Um, so how long did it take for you, and this, this may vary, um, you know, the first book, second book, third book, but how long did it take for you to actually finish and write a book? Finish and write is really different than finished and published. Those are, are, are really different. Because um, I have the proverbial book in the drawer, you know, that's just not going to, nobody else is going to read it. I might go dig it out one of these days when I'm New York Times bestselling author and we can see what we can shape it up into. People buy it anyway then, right? Um, so it, it actually takes me, I have friends who can write multiple books a year. It takes me about a year to do the research and the writing to get it edited and um, go through all the beta processes and, and then have it ready to, to, to go. So it takes me about a year, a book. Yeah, and for me, it sort of depends on how you count. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I... I initially did the research for my book and um, and wrote it back in I think it was 2006, and that whole process I, I did maybe three or four months of research and then I sat down and it all came out in about six weeks, um, and then wow. it sat on the shelf for <laughs> okay. uh, ten years uh, because it needed a rewrite. Right? It certainly didn't come out perfect the first time. There were things I was trying to do. I liked. I read a lot of science fiction, and I like books that jump around in the timeline. And I thought, well, I want to try to do that. And it turns out that's really hard to do well. And so I needed to untwist a lot of that and, and write it in a, a bit more of a linear fashion. But that was really difficult for me to do. I, when I was a student, I always just wrote papers and turned them in, right? I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time editing. So the whole idea of having to rewrite this book was really daunting. Uh, but I decided to leave my corporate job uh, last fall and wasn't sure what I was going to do next and decided it was time to just buckle down and pull it back out and rewrite it. So in that amount of, in that amount of time, the whole world of self-publishing had exploded. So that sort of changed things for me dramatically in terms of how I wanted to approach bringing it to market. And it seemed much less daunting to do the rewrite and then just be able to publish it as opposed to rewrite and then start the process of trying to find someone who's gonna publish it for me. So it, it was either it was either six months or 11 years <laughs> <laughs> in terms of depending on how you count. <laughs> right. It's kind of interesting to hear about different experiences. I think we're all different when we think about writing, and uh, writing is rewriting, and um, all that else that goes into it. Um, so if you want to think about getting an editor, or having it professionally edited, or um, having beta readers, and um, even when it comes to finally putting it out there, putting your work out there. So uh, it's kind of interesting hearing about different experiences. Um, so I'm glad to hear um, a little bit more about that. So thank you. Um, kind of the fun things, and I kind of feel like an evil mastermind asking this question, but do you have any writing rituals, things that are almost, I mean, that kind of sounds superstitious, but. Okay. <laughs> Just between us, right? I, it, well, first of all, the most important one is I'm going to leave for, for the next, for last, but I love having a candle lit on my desk. I don't know, there's an energy there. It sort of helps me stay focused and grounded and so, you know, don't tell anybody I told you that, but I have, you know, it's, it's, it's important. The other one is simply, have you heard the term bitchock? Doesn't that sound like a curse word? Bitchock. <laughs> it stands for butt in chair, hands on keys. 
<laughs> and that sometimes it's just the discipline that you have to do. You have to sit down and, and, and do a little bit of bit talking. And you mentioned uh, it's just between us. This, this is being recorded. Um, oh. Just wanted to let you know. <laughs> and I said okay, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> And I, I, I don't have a fun answer to that at all. I don't, I don't really have any rituals. I just, you just do it. sit down and do it. <laughs> then you really have the discipline down. I will find inspiration at 9 a.m. every morning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just uh, I, I like to write, and when I, when I sit down and start writing, it sort of comes relatively easily. Oh, that's the addictive part. Well, of course, I've only tried to write one book, so <laughs> if I ever tried to write another one, I can't say I'd have the same experience. But in this case, it, was, uh, it flowed. No, it's nice that even, it sounds like you even have that drive, too. It's just like you, you're very passionate about this, and so it just comes out. Yeah. Well, in this case, it, it did. Like I said, if I were trying to write a book about someone I don't know, uh, there's another character who appears in my book who I've been told I needed to write a book about him. Um, I can't say I'd have as much passion for that one. <laughs> not sure that's going to happen, but we'll see. And then, uh, Peg, you kind of mentioned the corporate world. I kind of wonder if that even drove passion, because you mentioned uh, you did the thrillers and if there's any characters that maybe are represented in your books or it's <laughs> maybe that's a dangerous question so <laughs> I, I'll, I, I'll, but you know what they wouldn't recognize themselves if they did cj box said one time that he he writes um mysteries and you've probably heard of him a little bit but he said that he modeled one character in one of his books just this really bad person after a bad person in town the, the guy never saw. He read the book. He never saw that it was him. And I think that that can happen a lot. Or it's a composite of different people that we meet along the way or, or that really bad person that lives in the back of our head, you know, that we sort of bring out every once in a while and play with. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately for me, the folks that uh, don't come off so well in my book, uh, they're called by name. Uh, and so they, they know each other. Or they know who they are. And... Um, uh, well, let's just say there's some tension uh, as a result of, of some of the stories I've told. Did you, like, have to hire a bodyguard or a lawyer or anything? Well, I haven't seen uh, this one uncle in particular oh, face to face. Family, family yeah, we're talking. This is uh, this one uh, lays it all out there. <laughs> so, um, uh, no, I have not seen him face to face since it's been published. <laughs> So I want to draw us back, too, because we kind of talked a little bit about um, the writing. But also, um, it's not sometimes just about writing the story, but also putting your work out there. Um, so if you want your work actually to be told, and I think that that's why a lot of us are here today, to kind of learn about self-publishing and um, really being supported for Indie Author Day. But what made you want to pursue actually not just writing the story down, but having um, pursuing self-publishing and actually letting the world know about this story. We love being vulnerable, don't we? <laughs> like standing on a street corner naked. And here. Right. I, that's what it is when you put a book out. It's just yeah. really scary. <laughs> it, it is scary, but it's also empowering. You know, for, for me, again, like I said, it changed, you know, the world changed so much between when I initially wrote the book and what I thought I was going to have to do to find someone who wanted to publish this story about this woman who who lived a colorful life, but, you know, it's, it's professional wrestling. It's not, um, uh, there's certainly a mass market for it, but it's uh, not um, for everybody. And, and so to be able to just forget that and say, all right, I, I've now written this book and it's available. You know, I can check the box and I've satisfied my wife that I've done it. <laughs> um, and, and I can go try to market it the way that I think it needs to be done, which for me involved uh, spending about six weeks traveling through the South this summer, setting up a table like the one in back in, in these little uh, crappy buildings where they're holding independent wrestling matches and 50 people show up and, and I sell, well, I walk away selling one or two books. I mean, talk about being naked on a street corner. I mean, it's very much, you have to put yourself out there, yeah. which is scary, but exciting and, and it can be fun. The, it's not always fun. Self, <laughs> Self-publishing used to have sort of a, like you said, a, a well, you didn't want to. It was vanity press. It was vanity press. You yeah. paid for it, and it was, and it had just a rotten connotation anywhere you went. 
And I had a friend who actually uh, went from being traditionally published to self-published, and she kind of mentored me to do that. And I'm glad that I did. I would sort of like to be, it's hybrid is the word now where you're, you're, you're in both camps, and I would sort of like to be there at one, at one time, but uh, one of these days. But right now I'm really happy where I am that I have complete control. I don't have to wait for two years before my book that I have finished writing actually makes it into my reader's hands. Um, I can pass on the title and the cover and everything like that. It's up to me. Of course, I have to take full responsibility if things are wrong. I can't. I have nobody else to blame. Yeah, and that's a um, a good segue into the next question. Um, and, and you mentioned hybrid publishing, and that's something to consider for you if you're really thinking about putting your work out there. Uh, is do I want to go traditional? Do I want to be self-published? Or there's the new model with hybrid that kind of blends um, traditional and self-publishing. Um, but when it comes to self-publishing, they really do have a lot of creative control to designing your own cover art uh, or hiring a team of professionals um, that may help with the formatting or the editing. Um, so I want to ask you, like, what do you, in the self-publishing process, what do you find to be the most fun but also the most challenging part of the process in self-publishing? Marketing, coming to these events. You know, writers, we're sort of like solitary people, kind of, that's where we're happiest, is when we're just all by ourselves in our cave, and we're, we're putting words down on paper. It's coming out and it's meeting. I sort of get off on it a little bit, but it's also, but it's getting the energy to, to go and do these kinds of things, um, to sit back there and, and hawk my book. I don't feel good about hawking my book. So th that's the hardest thing. But even traditionally published authors face that very same thing. So that, that isn't it. Um, <laughs> so for self-published, I don't know what a bad thing would be. Is that, was uh, that the Well, question? challenging sort it? of things. Um, but you're right about the marketing. I mean, um, you know, as a librarian, I go to a, a lot of conferences, and even the traditionally published are there, mm -hmm. and they're promoting their work, um, and then continuing to build that relationship with their community, their librarians, and also their readers. And so making their work available to as many people as possible um, all over the world or in their local communities. Um, so kind of thinking about how you want to expand your reach. How far do you want your reach to go? Um, um, and you listed that as your most fun? As your most fun uh, part of the self marketing? It's is like the worst. Oh, the challenging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the worst. The worst? Definitely had to clarify. I was like, okay. Yeah, for, for, I was going to say selling the book is the best and the worst because it's so exciting when the book sells. And, you know, I'm at this point selling very low numbers, right? So I, I log on to my Create Space member board and another book is sold, and I celebrate, you know, and I look at that almost every day, and believe me, not a book oh, sells Oh, and how about day. reviews? Oh, right, exactly. Yeah. When the reviews I, come out. Moth to flame every yeah, time. Absolutely. I, and moth to flame. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's really fun when it happens, but it's also the, just figuring out how to try to make it happen is, mm -hmm. is definitely the most challenging part. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's fun and... Um, frightening. Yeah. So I'm going to pull us back just really quick to the panel and then we'll, um, in order to pick up some of the, the recording that we're doing today, we'll have the microphones later at the end that way we can catch everything for those who want to review this later. Um, but you're bringing up some really great points and that actually segues in the next, into the next bit that you have a lot of options out there as a self-published writer to distribute, um, to work with even, if you're looking at building a team to make it the most professional product that you can put out there. Um, I'm gonna list a couple of kind of popular options here, but you have Amazon's, oh, I'm sure you kind of heard about these two, uh, you know, a little thing called Amazon, and uh, Amazon's Create Space, uh, Smashwords, and Lulu, and um, there's even a hybrid publisher, like Acorn Publishing has been around for many years. And um, so the question for the authors is, uh, how did you select who you wanted to distribute with. Um, so where you wanted to actually host your work. I started by doing research online to sort of read what different folks had to say about the different services that were available. And I ultimately selected two to start with. I, uh, for distribution through Amazon, uh, I went with CreateSpace. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, for, uh, and then I also did another version 
the same or different ISBN through Lulu in order to make that available to bookstores. What I ultimately found out for me was that I sold virtually nothing through Lulu because until I sell enough copies, bookstores aren't interested. Uh, and uh, there was one or two that bought one or two, and, but that doesn't do much. And so I ultimately, just recently, ended up canceling uh, the, or closing down the book on Lulu and, and have decided to go exclusively through CreateSpace and Amazon, in part because, well, the vast majority, well, virtually all the books I sold went through Amazon, and by going uh, exclusive through them, I was able to take advantage of some programs that they make available for marketing that are only available if you're exclusive. And so I think the jury's still out as to whether that was uh, a good idea, but I haven't really lost anything by, by dropping Lulu. And I would say I, I found CreateSpace a little bit easier to work with than Lulu. And for the copies that I wanted to buy in order to sell at events like this and elsewhere, it was much, much cheaper to be able to buy them through CreateSpace than Lulu. Uh, Lulu charges quite a bit for authors to buy their own books. Anecdotally, I've had several friends who have decided that they wanted to pull their work off of KDP Select, which is Amazon's um, thing, that, and you have to sign up and you're with them exclusively, and to put them on other platforms so that they were available for Nook, and you know everybody else, and they lost money when they did that. When they pulled their books off from because Amazon is the market for books. Um, if you want to pay your bills, you're going to have most of your most of your books or all of your books through KDP Select. I am considering um, pulling one down um, and and kind of testing, just one, <laughs> and testing the waters, because I think it could be a little bit different now than it was even a year or two ago. So, Yeah, that's the one thing about this field, especially with self-publishing. It's constantly changing, and I think it's changing much faster than traditional publishing is. And it's a learning curve. I think another reason why I just went with Amazon was because I'm lazy. I could I could do, I could get the ebook up and I could get the create space thing going and then I didn't have to think about it anymore and I didn't have to learn any of the other platforms and the other ways to, to, to do it like Lulu or iBooks or whatever. So it was, um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking the other components too. Um, even when choosing a platform, um, did you consider um, cover art or ISBN or um, readership or different formats, because you kind of mentioned if you wanted to put it out to the Kindle format or even the Nook readers, is that something um, that you considered in your process, um, where to get your cover art or even your ISBN numbers? I know that's kind of technical. Um, well, you know, Bowker is, is the ISBN king, and um, so I got, and if you buy a, if you buy ten IS, if you buy one ISBN number, you're probably going to be paying two hundred dollars. If you buy ten ISBN numbers, I, it's more than that, but it's but it's not two hundred dollars in ISBN. So you can get a block of them, and you want to do a different ISBN number for your paperback, and a different ISBN number for your ebook. I have not done different ISBN numbers for my audiobook. I don't know if if Amazon just takes care of that. Or not, but for the audiobooks, I don't, I don't use an ISBN. Yeah, that's a good point. For each edition, yeah, you definitely want to have a different ISBN, and the ISBN is going to make your discoverable, not just even to bookstores, but also to libraries. And that is how um, a lot of us will even come about finding it on um, through different platforms and being able to put it even in books and print. So that way, you can be discovered, um, which is a big a bibliographic database for um, us nerds up here, the librarians, um, who. Oh, okay, so the international standard book number, so an ISBN, um, and it's, it's that number that you would see on the back of the book that helps to, um, it's a unique identifier also, so just like you would for a barcode for a library book, it's the same um, for your self-published book, and that is going to make it unique for how people can go to find your particular book that you're trying to put out there. 
you can tell it can be a pretty complicated process, um, you know, kind of figuring out if you want to purchase them yourself or even the distributors um, who will actually assign you an ISBN. So it's just another one of those things that you'll have to consider in our next presentation. We'll go into kind of the nuts and bolts of um, kind of looking at the technical sort of things. So we'll review that much further on. I'm going to pull us back to the panel um, and uh, talk a little bit more. Um, I, you mentioned marketing also. Um, so books uh, don't sell themselves even though sometimes we wish that they would. <laughs> but um, at PPLD, we talked a little, the earlier session was uh, on Selfie and Library Journal about how to expand your audience for free, and that's a free service that we offer. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about marketing strategies uh, and how you, um, <laughs> I'll let you guys do the talking. I, just, I get to stand here and ask questions. Um, but what are some strategies you use to market yourself and your work? I have been focused primarily on the professional wrestling fan market to start with because that was the obvious audience for the book. There's thousands and thousands of people out there that uh, know my family's name and, and know my grandmother or, or knew, had seen her at matches and things like that. And so I've been get, uh, trying to get myself scheduled on as many podcasts as possible uh, because of research that I did that suggested you get the biggest bang for your buck out of out of appearing on podcasts. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of wrestling podcasts out there. And I've been on like six, so i got a ways to go <laughs> before I saturate that market. But the other thing that I'm doing, my goal is not, I'd love to sell a million books. Don't get me wrong. I, I would love to sell as many books as possible. But m my goal is to sell enough books to have somebody interested in making this into a movie. Uh, because it's, you know, it's a colorful environment. There's lots of crazy stories in the book that are all, well, mostly uh, true. Uh, there's only one that I can think of that's completely made up. And so, uh, so I'm trying to figure out how to tap that wider market. And I don't think I'm going to get there just by selling to wrestling fans. So I'm taking the somewhat non-traditional approach of I'm about to release the book, basically the same copy, I'm going to release a, an updated version of, of the one that I have that's listed in the nonfiction sections under biographies. And I'm going to release it under a different title with a different cover uh, that, uh, under the fiction sections, under uh, um, biographical fiction. And uh, trying to aim at a market that might not be interested in professional wrestling uh, to see if I can figure out how to tap into that I want to read a story about a strong woman market because where I have it now, I've just, I just don't think it, I'm going to break out uh, based upon the existing cover that I have, which shows a picture of my grandmother with Andre the Giant. Uh, I also found out that was a bad decision because I spend a lot of time at events explaining that it's not a book about Andre the Giant. <laughs> in fact, he doesn't even appear in the story. <laughs> and so uh, I've got a new cover coming out that's just a stylized picture of her. And I then, saw that online. That's a nice looking cover. Thank you. Very nice. Looks like an artist drawing or painting. It, yeah, thank uh, goodness for Photoshop, right? Yeah. You know, it, it took <laughs> a like photograph and applied some styling to it and, yeah. and came out with a, uh, something that looked uh, like, a, like a painting. And so then there's this other, uh, this other one that I'm calling The Woman Who Ruled the Ring that has uh, a completely uh, illustrated cover that I uh, contracted through Fiverr.com. If you're not familiar with that resource, you should check it out. It's F-I-V-E-R-R.com. And there are thousands of graphic artists of all kinds there uh, who will do an illustration or book cover for you for as little as $5. You might want to spend a little bit more to get something <laughs> higher quality and to get all the formats that you need, but it's a great resource if you don't happen to know a designer or someone uh, who, can, um, who can produce it for you. So you're looking at rebranding your current story. If yeah, co well, rebranding and, and you know both are going to be out there. So it's the same book, two covers, two titles. I'm trying to be very clear in the description about you know this is also published under a different title because I don't want to make anybody mad because they buy one and then they buy the other and realize it's the same inside. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just I'm just trying to sort of cast a wide net and, and figure out how to tap into a broader audience. Uh, my advice for, for building an audience, before I ever published my first book, I had a blog. I was on Facebook. 
Um, I, was, I was involved in that community, and I was making friends that, and not trying to sell them a book. And I think that that kind of makes a little bit of a difference. I met authors through um, different conferences and stuff who I helped promote their books and who now uh, endorse mine because I did that for them just because that's what, you, that, that's what you do. So you can do some planning ahead of time in order to get your name, uh, get a base of people who might give you a shot to, to read one of your books just because they sort of like you on Facebook. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. Um, I, I actually teach a class on uh, Publish Your Own, which kind of talks about resources. And those are some common um, marketing strategies that you can use. Um, so definitely thinking about your cover art, thinking about how you want to expand your audience. And, um, you know, I've heard about blogs and websites, certainly using those and even exchanging reviews, things like that, and developing those relationships. So I won't exchange reviews. Oh. I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't feel honest to me. So mm -hmm. don't ask me to review your book and you can review mine. Yeah, and you certainly have to pick the strategy that works for you. So yeah, that's definitely true. Speaking of Facebook, I just want to put a plug out there for a group that uh, I found because the guy who runs it happens to be a wrestling fan and read my book. But it's, it has a uh, rather awkward name of, I think it's just called Authors Sharing Book Marketing Ideas. Uh, but it's a, it's a good group and this one guy uh, does most of the posting, but he's constantly putting uh, articles out and things that he finds about um, independent authors and and sort of best practices for spreading the word. Yeah, so definitely lots to think about out there if you're looking at self-publishing. Um, so this is a very general sort of question, but what advice do you have for writers or aspiring authors? Do it. <laughs> Sit down. Get get on. Get the hands on the keyboard. Do it. And, and get to a point at some point where you're really ready to get some honest feedback from people that aren't related to you. And, and, and I think that that's important. So you can have some people who can say, I don't really don't like the way this whole opening scene feels. Because uh, your mom's not going to tell you that. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that is a very good point. Oh, okay. so, oh whoops. Uh -oh. <laughs> Maybe in your case. <laughs> yeah, but certainly looking for like, a, yeah, that objective opinion mm -hmm. and things. Uh, and definitely, I like that. Just do it. There we go. Just sum it up. Um, so uh, any future projects that you're working on? I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on this project right now. Yeah. One of the things that I've recently learned about me and what helps me write a book is I, there needs to be some sort of an underlying issue that I feel something for. Um, and the last book that I just, um, j just came out is on human trafficking. The one before that had to do with depression in Santeria. The one before that had to do with undocumented uh, immigrants and, and organ donation. And my first one was not really a social issue, it was on a, a kind of a uh, bio-weapon thing. But I need to find something that, I, that triggers me to write that book, and usually it's something that scares me. That's what I have found. When I, when I started doing the research for, for Trafficked, it just about buried me. And it was a very scary thing to learn about. So I am now learning, um, some, going into um, my next book, looking a little bit about at hate groups. Okay, well the next part we'll move into questions from the audience, um, but is there any final sort of things that you wanna say before we move into questions or? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'm gonna have, uh, have you speak in the microphone, that's how our recording equipment will pick it up, but any questions from the audience? How did you find your editors? Look in front. Of, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Look in, in the front of the books that you'd like to read, and find out who's mentioned as the editor. If they if they used um, um, an independent editor, th their name is likely to be mentioned there. So if you're whatever genre you're writing in, look in those books and find out who edited edited them, and then contact that editor. And it, you can also get it by word of mouth. Yeah, for me, it was my stepmother. She was uh, 
English teacher for many years and not afraid to speak her mind. And so <laughs> I knew I would get honest feedback from her. So it was a little easy in that case. I wanted to ask you, what is the category that you market your book in? Thrillers first. Is that the only one? No, also suspense. And the and trafficked, I think, one time got marketed through somebody else, um, social comment, social something. I have no idea what it was. I was just wondering how you find, like you're going to branch out from wrestling, and I work a lot with women, and empowering women, that's my thing. So there's, it's, it's like what you think it is, and then what other people might see too. So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you expand your thinking maybe? I sort of crawled the catalog and went through on Amazon all, you know, down different paths and looked at the kind of books that were there. And I've got, for the new release, about six or eight categories that I want to put it in. And when you initially release on Amazon, they'll let you do three. And then if you send an email to support one at a time, you can get them added to as many as you like. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's oh. what I learned from that indie book marketing. Wow. Or, I, uh, Facebook group. Okay, cool. So, uh, so I was able to get the first one in about four or five categories on the nonfiction side, and I'm going to be shooting for six or eight on the fiction side for the re-release. But it was, it, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. I, I don't know if they're the right ones, uh, but they're the ones at this point that make the most sense to me. Any other questions? Really fast, we'll have a question back here and then we'll, I'll bring it up front. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering how important um, book reviews are for selling your books and if you actually read your book reviews. <laughs> I'm kidding. I definitely read my book reviews. And I try to, and I read every one that comes through on Amazon too. And, I, and at this point, there are few enough of them that I at least give a thanks or try to comment on all of them. Uh, but that's actually something that I'm struggling with and would love to hear what Peg has to say because I would I don't know where to I would love to get what they call an editorial review in order to be able to include in the listing but I, I don't know where to start with that reviews are very important um, as an author like I, I think I said earlier I'm drawn to read all of my reviews like a moth to flame unlike you, I don't comment on any of them because I almost feel like I'm interrupting a private conversation. And, and I don't want to do that. If somebody is talking about my book and they're saying bad things, I don't want to <laughs> encourage them to say more bad things. If they're saying really great things, I want them to feel comfortable and not like I'm stalking them, you know? So I don't, I don't comment on mine. Um, I get some book reviews by giving my book away for free and asking people to give an honest review. I have a newsletter. Oh, I should have brought my newsletter sign-up sheet. Shoot. Um, that I will get beta readers from. And before a book is published, they will be given advanced copies to read it so that hopefully on the day that it comes out, I've got a few reviews that show up. So it is, it's, it's, being, it's giving, being willing to give your book away for free, but asking for some support, honest reviews in return. Was, was there another part to that question? Okay. I just wanted to, is this on? Hello. There we go. Um, to address what Peg was saying. I noticed in your books I was looking at that on, in the front matter, you have your editor and, mm -hmm. and her website. Um, some people don't do that. I try to get my clients to do that. <laughs> but almost always, if you look in the acknowledgments, they won't have a website, but they will have, they'll, they'll tell you their name. Uh, sometimes they'll give you your agent's name, but they'll tell you the editor's name, and then you can look them up by the name that way, too. Great. Any other questions? OK, we have a question in back. As she walks back there, a little bit more on the editor thing and, and word of mouth. If you can join some writing groups that, that are other authors that write in your genre, you're gonna get, you can get some names from them. I had a question about KDP Select. I just wanted to know if you personally ever um, use the opportunity for free giveaway days or countdown deals, and which do you prefer? 
Have you done it? I, I haven't yet. I'm, I've only been into KDP Select for about three weeks now, because that's when I shut off Lulu. Uh, so I haven't, and I've been focused on trying to get the other, the other books, out, you know, the, the re-releases out. Uh, but I've heard good things about those programs from, from other self-published authors. I have mixed feelings. Um, I do use free, and, I, and, I, and I've used my free days a lot. And that's where I get a lot of reviews is when you have a, a free day. But you've got to get the word out that your book is free for those days. And so there's some, there's some other book bub has done amazing things for, for my visibility. And um, so so... That's where you can get the reviews. I like free better than Countdown because I think it gets too confusing for people. And then you're also pushing. You feel like you've got to push your book a little bit more if you're doing a Kindle Countdown deal. I would just rather not be selling all the time. So free is, I like it. The, what I don't like about it is that a lot of people have a gazillion free books in their Kindles that they will never get to. And the whole point is to get a review and to get some readers. So I have, I have mixed feelings about free. I might go to 99 cent sometimes. OK, any other questions? All right, down here in front. When you were talking about that, did that work? Hello. Um, when you were talking about the marketing group that um, you utilized, did they lead you to some of your new strategies, or was that a result of some of the stuff that they um, kind of guided you towards, or was that stuff you came up with on your own? They didn't lead me toward the strategy of, of releasing two versions, uh, but they did lead me toward the decision to go exclusively with Amazon, to spend some money on the cover art as opposed to the first one was completely, um, I did it myself because I've got a little bit of Photoshop skills. Uh, and they, there's a, one article that I saw on that list that, uh, on, on the group that had a, a comparison of uh, different steps that, uh, it was basically a difference in what someone who sold 5,000 copies uh, has, done versus someone who's not sold that many. And you know it included things like editorial reviews and uh, setting up pre-orders. And, and it was basically all of these steps that successful authors did and unsuccessful authors didn't do. And so it's art articles like that I found helpful as they came through the feed. Peg, specifically, you said you have a newsletter uh, and you had a blog before you published your first novel. Mm -hmm. Do you still have both the blog and the newsletter? And how much time do you devote to that? I'm, I'm like stealing time to get in the writing chair, and I can't imagine how do you find time to produce that newsletter or that blog? Well, my newsletter is really simple because usually I highlight another author on my newsletter. And I mean, I give them kind of an update as to what I'm doing, and then I highlight I'm, so I'm not saying buy my book. I'm highlighting somebody else. So the, and I do, I do it once a month now. I used to do it much less frequently. But once you get to a certain, certain level of subscribers, you have to pay. <laughs> and if I'm paying, I'm sending out a newsletter. <laughs> so, um, and my blog, I just, um, I, I do a group blog called Mr. Ristas. There's a whole bunch of us on the, on the blog, which is, kind, I just do uh, one Wednesday a month with them. My personal blog is, has, I just had my website redesigned, so we moved it from Blogger to WordPress, and I haven't been able to quite figure out. I can do the blog in WordPress, but I don't know how to get it to my subscribers yet. My technical gal needs to figure that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Facebook, and I was just wondering if either of you participate on any other social media, so you can like plug yourselves right now. I created a, a Facebook page for the book and a Twitter account for the book. And mostly what I do is I've got, and some of them are in the back here, lots and lots of old wrestling photographs that that uh, there's a lot of folks out there interested in seeing. So I, I very rarely directly plug the book, but instead I, I, take, I try to deliver value to groups that are interested in sort of the content that I have and then let them find 
the the Facebook page or the Twitter account and realize there's a book associated with it. So, yeah. so yeah, I'm definitely trying to pursue the a social media. That's a very angle. good strategy. I mean, you know, give them something that they're interested in, and then they have they say, well, let me find out more about this guy, see what he's doing. I have linked. I've got a um, Facebook author page and then a personal page, and the they they are linked to Twitter, so I don't have to tweet. So if I just put and Facebook for me is sort of like my water cooler because I don't talk to anybody else. So <laughs> I hang out at Facebook, and when I put something up there, it automatically is tweeted, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, great questions. Anybody else have one? Okay, down in front. I do like your marketing strategy. I found in the library, I love my library, Mari Smith's book, The New Relationship Strategy, something, M-A-R-I, Smith, wonderful, talks about being friends. Networking means creating friends, giving value rather than go buy, buy, buy. So mm -hmm. I like your, your approach. Uh, I have a question that maybe is going to be in the nuts and bolts, but did you, w did you look at iBooks or Ingram Spark at all? Ingram Spark seems like you really got to know your stuff and be a true, in, you know, publisher. A but guy I know who is an independent author who's been very successful. He write, he's written a few books about sort of the return. Uh, he, he was a, ex, a former soldier. He's written books about trying to reassimilate and things like that. And so he sold many, many copies. And he told me he had a nightmare experience with Ingram Spark that it was super difficult to use. Really? And that he, he, was, he was sort of the nail in the coffin for me in terms of deciding to go with Lulu and Amazon to start with because he said Spark was just so difficult. I'm considering Ingram Spark or, or some other sort of distribu distributor. Uh, and they do have things set up now for indie authors um, to go through. So it isn't specifically, you don't have to have a publisher. I would probably do it with through Bark Publishing, but, but it's a different approach. And that's actually something that I go through. Um, I'm having a class for Publish Your Own in November, and I have a list of different distribution channels that I have. But that's just something you'll consider um, when you're thinking about self-publishing the distribution channel and um, what platform you want to have it on. And I can always email that list if you're interested. So when's class? Oh, uh, it's going to be, it's on the calendar coming up. It's, I think it's at the end of November. Um, I can't remember which date. I think November 30th, but I can check on that for you at the end of this, okay. this session. Um, for now, though, we still have a few minutes. If there's any other questions, uh, it's a publish your own class. So it's um, it's an overview about self publishing and a little bit about hybrid and a little bit about traditional. Question in the back. Okay, I'll go here at the end. Did you do your own formatting for both your paperback and your dot .mobi formats? And if you do go to other um, distribution, um, like Nook, et cetera, are you going to do your own formatting for that? Or did you hire somebody on Fiverr? I did it all myself. I'm pretty skilled with Word and uh, was able to download a template uh, that made it pretty easy, relatively easy. If, you, if you're not comfortable with Word, you might struggle. And for distribution through Nook, that just happened through Lulu. So there was one, had to do one type of formatting for Kindle and another one uh, for Lulu, which then covered Nook and any other uh, um, ebook formats. I believe that's right. Yeah, EPUB on Lulu and Mobi on Kindle, I think is how it works. I hire it. Uh, Liberwriter does the EPUB. I mean, does the Mobi, the dot Mobi, and they're and they're owned by Amazon. They're very inexpensive. They get your your chapter things up in the front that are supposed to be there, um, and they're very very quick. They're like usually two one to two day turnaround time for them. Um, and then my cover designer designs the interior for my paperbacks. So. Her name is um, Patty G Henderson. She lives in Florida. Um, Boulevard Photographica is the name of her company. And I'm very happy to get you more information on her if you'd like to just to give me your email or whatever. I'll get it to you. 
And um, the authors will also have a table in the back of the room, so feel free to chat with them too after this session and, um, and learn a little bit more about their books. And I think there was a question here. How the heck did you get BookBub? <laughs> I've actually gotten BookBub a few times. And, and, but the last two times on traffic, they turned me down. And I'm just really ticked about that. So BookBub is an amazing marketing thing. Um, they go to millions of people. Once a day, they send out emails on, on books that are free or reduced in price based on genre. So, so people sign up, readers sign up based on what they're interested in. And um, the very first, th maybe the second time I was on BookBub, I probably, and I had a book for free, kind of in the middle of the month. I had 50,000 downloads, between 50 and 75,000, somewhere in there, downloads. And then I um, had sales that increased, that kept going up after the, the free period was over because of BookBub. And you have to pay, it's maybe four or $500 now for one day, one email, <laughs> one ad, and you get your money back every time. BookBub. So when you said you've done it once or twice, that was because you chose to pay for it once or twice? Uh, they've accepted, they also have to accept you. And so many people now are trying to get on BookBub. Part of the reasons I'm thinking about taking one book down and putting it on, on different platforms as I think that's one of the things that BookBub looks for, is how many platforms is it available on. Um, it's, but uh, the, the last two times they have turned me down, which was very offensive to me because they've never turned me down before. <laughs> okay, we've probably got about four minutes left. Any final questions? You have burning questions? Like I said, they will have a table in the back, He'll, and there's a reception following our presentation. So feel free to stick around. We'll have some light refreshments and things, and you'll have a chance to mingle and talk a little bit more about, and look for advice, if maybe about your particular uh, situation or your interests. Okay, any final questions? Okay, so um, I'm just going to turn back to the authors real fast, Peg and Brandon. Any uh, final thoughts that you have concluding the panel? Thank the library system for doing this. This is amazing. I tried to find one in Aurora or someplace closer to home, and you guys took me in as a, the stray. That, that Actually, we're both strays. We're both strays, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, thank, thank you. you very, thanks all for coming in to the library for having us. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much for being here today to share your experiences, answer our, our questions, and um, it's great having you here. And they'll be in the back for questions and um, also selling their books and to learn more about their projects, any sort of experience that you want to would like to learn. Up next, we'll have a presentation about the nuts and bolts about, um, so if you're interested in the technical, kind of how do I get started? How do I assemble everything? Any other, these technical questions that you have, we'll answer that in the next segment. That'll be starting at 2.30. Um, so feel free to, um, and thank you. Thank you again. Well, good afternoon. I'm Tim Blevins. I'm with Special Collections, which is the Pikes Peak Library District's Regional History and Genealogy Division. And uh, a few of us are going to be talking to you about uh, our experience in do-it-yourself publishing. Um, now, do-it-yourself publishing is self-publishing, but it's doing all of the work. And uh, it's kind of our objective here is to uh, go through what we do uh, for our publishing efforts to give you an idea of what is involved, especially if you've never done it uh, yourself, and then you can kind of decide if that's something you choose to do or perhaps uh, get help. And uh, so that's kind of the objective here. Now, I'd like to see a show of hands of those of you who have not yet published your first first book, but that's your, your goal. You have a book that, so there are a few of you here who are just starting out. Uh, now, how many of you have published or have helped others publish? So quite a few of you. So those of you who raised your hands earlier, these are the experts in the room. And uh, so you want to talk to them for sure during the reception. Uh, so this is really intended for people like you who have never done it before, or perhaps some of you who um, 
Uh, you've had others do it, and you thought, well, maybe this is something I'd like to try myself. Um, every one of you has different goals, and every one of you will have a different path to achieve those goals. So what we're going to show you today is not necessarily the best route for you, but it'll kind of give you a high-level view of some of the, the things that we do. Uh, what I thought we'd start out with is, uh, let's click that. There we go. Maybe cover a few reasons of why one might want to self-publish. There are lots of reasons. I'm just going to cover a few high points. Uh, one might be uh, to save money. Uh, it can be expensive to publish a book. So um, if you do the work yourself, you might be offsetting a lot of costs. Uh, you may have a lot of skills that you want to put to work, or you have some creative juices that you really want to focus on creating a product, be it a print book or an EPUB or anything of that sort. Uh, you really may have uh, interest in controlling the end product. Um, I hesitate to use the word obsessive, uh, but uh, you may have a real specific idea of what you want, and it may be easier for you to do it yourself than to, to communicate that to somebody else to do for you. And as Peg said, how hard can it be? <laughs> now, of course, there are going to be reasons why you may not want to self-publish. Uh, one of those reasons could be that it takes a lot of time, uh, pull your hair out. Um, you either have to have an abundance of money or an abundance of time. <laughs> Patience is a good thing to have either way, probably. Uh, you have to have some skills. If you're going to be doing this, um, if you're unfamiliar with the software, um, and unwilling to use the software, then doing it yourself is not the way to go. Uh, you really have to be able to operate basic, uh, uh, have basic computer skills at the very least. Uh, you have to have some realistic expectations. Um, I like to say one of my best assets is I don't know what isn't possible. Um, that gets me into trouble sometimes because once you have a goal and you really have these lofty ideas, it's sometimes very difficult to achieve those. And having somebody who has experience with actually doing this kind of work can really bring you back down to what is maybe most cost effective or something that uh, is really more realistic. And then if, it's, if, you're, if, it's, if you're not having fun, uh, then you probably shouldn't be doing this. It's, it's probably a lot more frustrating and uh, you don't want to be crying over this. You want to be enjoying this. And so having somebody help you uh, with the things that you are unfamiliar with doing or don't want to learn how to do, that might be the best solution for you. So what we're going to talk to you about uh, is our experience uh, with the regional history series of books. Uh, that's the Pikes Peak Library District series that we publish. It's based on an annual history symposium uh, we do every year in June. Uh, we pick a subject, we do an or a national call for papers. We've had international speakers come. They provide papers, uh, we edit the papers and produce books. Uh, next year will be our 15th year of the symposium. Uh, we've published 16 books. Um, those were based on the symposia and also we reprint books that uh, relate to the subject of the symposia, kind of like primers. Uh, for, for those years. Uh, so just to give you an idea of wh what context this uh, should be placed in, uh, these are nonfiction books. So what this is going to tell you is that we're probably the worst case scenario for book publishing because it's the most complicated. If you're writing fiction, uh, a lot of this uh, would not apply, so uh, it wouldn't be as bad as, it, as we might paint it to be. Uh, now we have a niche market. Uh, we're really targeting uh, local history. And uh, so we don't have a real broad national market to, to try to appeal to. Uh, we do all, do all of the work in-house. So we do all of the editing, the indexing, uh, the marketing, and we also do the cover design. So everything is done by staff, who you'll meet here shortly. And then, um, this might sound bad, but we really don't care if we sell a book. Uh, that's not really our goal. Uh, our goal is to cover our printing costs. We do print on demand, uh, so that means we can order one book and um, not have to stockpile them, and we order them as we need them. 
Uh, the service we use, we order on Monday, we'll have them the next Monday. So we get them turned around very quickly. So uh, uh, if we cover the printing costs, we're uh, achieving our, uh, our goals there. Uh, we are not interested in selling books ourselves. Uh, we've outsourced the distribution. Uh, we contract that out, and so we don't have to worry about that end of, of, um, of the process. So I'd like to introduce to you two people, Tim Morris, uh, who's Special Collections Manager. Uh, he's going to talk to you about editing and proofreading. And uh, then I'd, uh, I'd also like to introduce uh, Heather Jordan, who's our archivist. And uh, she'll be talking about uh, using InDesign, which is the software we use, uh, and d the design process using illustrations, indexing, and all of those pieces uh, that result in uh, the books that we make. So I'm going to turn this over to Tim Morris. Thanks, Tim. Okay, so we'll talk about editing. Um, I'll also be talking about proofreading later on, and for our purposes, a lot of people use editing and proofreading um, interchangeably, but they're very distinct and different uh, 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 processes uh, that'll occur at different times during uh, the writing and creation of a book. And so for the first part, I'll be talking about editing. Um, and for editing, what you may want to consider uh, as a writer, if you're, if you're the one writing this, thinking ahead towards the editing process, some of the choices that you'll have uh, to be making um, that can help the editing process uh, move along. So in the context of the Regional History Series books, we have uh, a, a lot of different choices that have already been set for us that kind of help guide how our editors work together um, and, and get the books uh, edited. One thing that you need to consider is style. Now, if you're writing fiction, obviously there's different stylistic choices you can make, different perspectives. Um, but for us, we use, uh, in nonfiction, uh, Turabian style. Uh, Turabian is uh, uh, similar to Chicago style, which is commonly used for historical writing. APA would be used for uh, psychology, things like that. So there's, there's set standards. If you're going to be a nonfiction writer, you may want to be familiar with and have those in mind as you're writing the book. Uh, that way you have um, kind of a, a already uh, a set format that you're going to be working with that can help your editors and that can help, um, help you keep it consistent. Um, another thing to consider along those lines would be like the font, right? Just kind of some of the stylistic choices you're making. Um, the other things that you need to consider are standards. And so we use uh, authority files, uh, meaning if we're talking about the United States Geologic Survey, we would do USGS. Um, if we're talking about spelling choices, um, we have uh, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, and, we, and so in the English language, some words are spelled differently, and that way your editors have something they can go to um, as a single source to help kind of uh, make sure that those choices are already made and that they aren't up left in the air for uh, opinion. <clears throat> As a writer, uh, it helps to have your organization together, your flow, your content, right? You want to have an identifiable, clear argument. Your editors are going to help you kind of bring that together, um, but uh, you're going to want to make sure that your ideas transition smoothly that your content is relevant, um, that you aren't being redundant with word choice. So for example, you have the same word five different times in the same paragraph. You may want to choose some, some different uh, word choices, and the editors will help you with that as well. And then, of course, accuracy. So for us, writing in a historical context, uh, publishing in a historical context with nonfiction history books, um, something that might be important to consider would be uh, naming choice, uh, Manitou versus Manitou Springs. The name changed at different points in history, and so when you're using it in the book, you want to make sure that it matches the, the time frame. <clears throat> now, another thing that you may want to consider for your editors uh, that can help them out and help you out as the writer is uh, what type of uh, editing process you're going to be using. Are you going to be using software, uh, Microsoft Word, for example, or are you going to be using uh, just hand hand copy, uh, hard copy paper. So, for example, if you're using Microsoft uh, Word, likely you're going to have maybe something that looks like this. Um, this is just an example where you've got track changes turned on, you've got comments added, and we use a number of different editors, and so 
uh, those different comment sections would likely be different colored representing the different editors. And so you'll have different comments regarding different aspects of the, of the pages there and the words. And you've got uh, choices uh, made for deletion, addition, spelling changes. Um, maybe you want to move things around a little bit if the flow isn't quite working. This paragraph works better at this section. So there's a lot of uh, communication that needs to be involved between the editors as well. Now, if you're using hard copy, your editors all need to be familiar with the type of marks that, are, are, that you're going to be using. There's, these are just examples of standard editor's marks. Um, so for example, I'm not sure if you can see it that well, but uh, Belgium with the lowercase b, three lines underlining indicating that that should be capitalized, and so on and so forth. So these can be, these standardized marks can be helpful to make sure that uh, everyone's using the same type of editing um, system. Okay, now once you've made these choices, and, and of course, uh, in the context that we're doing it, cost is a, is a factor that you may want to consider. And so, do you, all your editors, if you're, if you're working with multiple editors, if, you're, if you've outsourced and, and gotten your editors together and you've got a number of them, um, do they all have the same software capabilities? Do they all have the same uh, access to software? Things like that. <clears throat> so, if you're using editors uh, that you're not essentially buying, you're not sending out your paper to be edited by a, a professional company or a person, and you're uh, at a low cost trying to find multiple editors to help edit your paper, um, there are advantages to having multiple editors. So for example, with us, we use uh, approximately three to five editors per, uh, per chapter in, in each of these books. And um, each of these editors brings with them a different skill set. Some of them have a different knowledge base. Some of them have more of an English background and so are able to catch a lot of the grammar and mistakes. Some of them have a more of a historical background and so are, are able to catch some of those maybe contextual um, mistakes and content mistakes. Um, so having multiple editors really does help our process um, with these books. And, it, and it, I think it could apply to any fiction or nonfiction work to have multiple editors. Um, and then as a writer, having multiple editors also gives you the advantage of having multiple choices um, when it comes to making those changes. You'll see the editor's marks, you'll see their comments, um, and you'll get to choose what you think will work best for, for your book. Now, the purpose of editors, unfortunately, um, we, we would love everybody to praise our work Right? Um, but the, the, the purpose of the editors is to provide critical review and feedback. And so I know this sounds impossible, but as a writer, you need to emotionally remove yourself uh, from any attachment to the paper. Um, what you're looking for is that critical review and feedback that can help really bring the paper together um, and make it into, or the, the book, into something that is um, really more professionally done. You have ideas in your head um, and you have a, an argument in your head, but maybe it's not conveyed the best possible way. So having multiple editors who are providing critical feedback really is um, something that you would want to really focus on when choosing editors. So having loved ones do it can be helpful if they are willing to kind of remove themselves from the relationship and be the editor. Um, but otherwise, it may help be helpful to have people who are um, more in a professional relationship, um, teachers or, or um, friends of friends. <laughs> and then, of course, communication is really the key with all of this. As I mentioned, we do um, we use about four, uh, three to five editors uh, for each chapter going through the book um, as we're compiling it. They all have different sections in the comments there. We use Microsoft Word for, uh, and we use Dropbox so that all the editors are able to um, open the same uh, master file and go into it, make changes, and um, we can see who's made what changes. We also have a kind of a reviewer's log so that we can keep in, in a dialogue between authors uh, or uh, editors rather, what works, what doesn't work, what parts did you find strong, what parts needed some work. Um, things like that that you can have. So the editors, them, uh, it helps, I think, to have 
communication between each other rather than just going editor to writer and, uh, and keeping them separated. Um, so we have multiple editors making multiple notes and we have those review notes for broad thoughts, um, questions that lingered, um, anything that needs to be added or changed. Um, and so those lines of communications between the editors really are uh, very important. Um, so uh, that being the case, we'll get into more of the assembly of the book that, uh, that I think you'll probably find very interesting. So I'll turn it over to our archivist, Heather Jordan. Hello. Okay. So there are a lot of different small things to think about when you are um, thinking about formatting and designing your book. I'm specifically going to talk about some of the things we did for our most recent regional history series book, which was uh, benefic bigwigs and benefactors of the Pikes Peak region. So you want to think about software. There's a lot of different options available. Um, there's word processing software, book layout software, and then there's also hybrids of both. Um, as Tim mentioned, um, we receive our chapters and edit in Word, um, but we use Adobe InDesign for our book layout. Um, you want to consider things like your budget, the type of book that you are creating, and then you also want to consider the learning curve when you're choosing um, which software to use. And you want to research this pretty well in advance so you have time to download all the software as well as become familiar with it. So this is an example of a chapter in um, InDesign, and you can see all of the various tools that you can use around the edges here. Um, no matter what software you decide to go with, um, there are some things you want to consider, and I'm just going to talk about some of the choices that we made with this book. Um, so for all of our chapters in Big Wigs, we did choose to have an image on the left page and then start the text of each chapter on the right. Um, we did do single space, book Antiqua for the font, and you'll see the first paragraph is not indented, all the remaining paragraphs are. Um, in our titles, we do use ampersands if appropriate, um, and these are all just really small things, but they're all things you want to consider before you get to this stage. Um, and these are all things that we follow for each of our books. Um, we also do choose to avoid things um, that are called widows and orphans, and that's when you have basically a short line at the beginning or the end of your paragraph that's sort of left dangling. So as an example of that, if we stopped that page at the word discomfort, that last really short line would be moved to the next page and it would be up on the next page by itself and that's called an orphan. So that's something we choose not to do in our books because visually that's not something that we think um, looks nice. So it's just really small things, but they're things to think about. Um, this is also the point where we will add our header information. Um, so what we do is we have an abbreviated um, chapter title on the left, and then we have the last name of the author on the right page, um, both in caps and italics. And then um, Tim talked about how we use the Turabian style. That's something you still want to keep in mind, even um, though you have been through the editing process at this point, because sometimes things do get missed, and this is your opportunity to fix that. And then there's really not necessarily a right or wrong here. Um, it's just really the key is consistency. Um, if you do something in chapter one, be consistent and make sure you do it in all of your following chapters as well. So for our series of books, we use a lot of illustrations. Um, and we use photographs, maps, charts, and if you're interested in using illustrations in your book, there are um, a lot of things you want to consider. Okay, so we edit our images using Photoshop. Um, but there are a lot of image editing software options available. Um, again, just like the book layout software, you wanna keep things in mind such as your budget, um, the type of book you're creating, as well as the learning curve. I personally found Photoshop sort of difficult to learn. Um, I didn't find it particularly intuitive. Um, so if you're not really savvy with that sort of thing, you wanna think about that as you're researching what you wanna use. Um, no matter what software you use though, there are certain things um, 
to, that you can do with any software. I'm gonna just talk about a few things that we do with Photoshop. Um, so all of our images are grayscale, so we change all of that, and um, I have an example of how to do that on the left. The only color image we use is on the cover. Um, you can also do things like cropping, you can increase resolution on an image, um, you can also play with the background levels, which I have um, examples of here on the right. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize, though, is that how something looks on your computer monitor is not necessarily how it's going to look when you get your printed book. And I will talk about that in just a few minutes, but keep that in mind um, because you're going to probably end up coming back and doing a little more adjusting later. So once you've done your initial image adjustment, adjustments, um, you want to think about placement in your book. So I just have two examples here from our Big Wigs book. On the left-hand side is an image of Monument Valley Park. And you can see it's a fairly large image. It spreads from one side of the page to the other. And it's just placed um, where it makes sense in the context of the chapter. And then on the right-hand side, we have an image of Queen Palmer. And you can see that she's facing away from the spine. Something that we choose to do is if we have an image of a person, we don't want them facing into a spine or directly off of a page. Um, and that's just a choice that we make. Um, once you have an image on a page, you can move it around and you can also play with the size of it. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that if you do adjust that, it also adjusts the text on the page. And it's not necessarily just adjusting the text on this page, it will adjust the text on the pages that come after it as well. Um, so if you are choosing to avoid the widows and orphans that I talked about, this is the stage where you wanna look for those, um, especially if you're adjusting the size of your images. So along with your images, you want image captions, which gives you two types of information. Um, one would be your citation information. Um, so this is where you can put the name of your image, the date, if there's an image number that corresponds with it, you add that here. And then you also wanna include relevant details that aren't necessarily in the text of your chapter. So you can see as far as formatting, um, between the caption and the image, there's really not a whole lot of space. Um, and when then we do include a little more space between the caption and the text to make it easier to read. And this is an image of the Will Rogers Shrine of the Sun. Um, this particular image came from the chapter's author, so we didn't need to put an image number, there wasn't one. Um, but we did include the name, the date, and then we also added the name of the designer of um, the shrine, which was not mentioned in the chapter. Okay, so if you're using an image Simply putting citation information is not enough. You do need to get the proper authority to do so. Um, at the library, we use images um, from our own collection as well as Colorado College, Denver Public Library has a large image collection, um, Pioneers Museum, um, and all of those places have on their website how to use their images. Um, most of them do require that you fill out um, a request form and sign an agreement. And most of the forms do include information, including how they want your um, image cited. Um, they also do typically ask that you send them a free copy of your published book. Um, some places require two copies of your published book. So that's something to keep in mind um, if you have a specific budget. Um, you will need to send them free copies. Um, images cost money. Um, there isn't a standard fee. Um, it really depends on the institution. Some are pretty affordable, and then some places really charge quite a lot to use their image. Um, so that's something to think about. I have examples here of two agreements. Um, on the left-hand side is the Colorado College Agreement for using an image. You can see it's pretty short. Um, it includes how to cite the, their image on your book. And then on the, on the right here, um, this is a Pioneers Museum Agreement, and this is one of four pages. Um, so you can see every institution is really different. Um, so if you plan on using illustrations, just be prepared for a pretty wide variety of requirements. So along with uh, your chapters, you wanna think about front matter. Um, the ISBNs were talked about during the author panel. Um, this is something that we do for our books. Um, as was mentioned earlier, different formats require different numbers, so your print book will need a different number than um, your ebook. 
Um, the last time I checked, a single ISBN ran about 125, or you could buy a bundle of 10 for $295. Um, so if you're planning on having different formats, or if you're planning on publishing more in the future, it might be more cost effective to buy a bundle. Um, I know you can buy them in tens. I think you can even buy 100 of them at a time or more. Um, at the library, we do have them in um, bundles, so we're able to do that. Um, of course, your table of contents you want to add to the front. Um, if you're using an image from an institution or a personal collection, um, this is where you can also add the citation information for that. And then a foreword, which serves as an introduction to your book. We have them in all of our regional history series books. And then if you'd like to have an acknowledgments, um, you can add that to your front matter, and this is your chance to thank people who helped you with the book, editors, uh, proofreaders, people who maybe inspired you to write the book. Some people choose to have that towards the end of their book. Um, this is something we put in our front matter that's really up to you. We do include a bibliography in all of our books, um, and this is just a way for readers to continue learning about a topic. Um, so this is the bibliography for the Big Wigs book, um, and it's just suggested reading material um, about other local Big Wigs and benefactors. And remaining consistent with um, our chapters, we still have an image on the left, and then we start our bibliography on the right-hand side. And then if you're writing a nonfiction book, you may want to think about creating an index, which um, enhances a book's usefulness. Um, all of our regional history series books do have indexes. Um, and when we add books to our collection, we do check and um, factor in if a book has an index or not. Um, still remaining consistent, we have the image on the left and the index on the right. So things you may want to think about indexing are people, places, things. Um, you do want to uh, index your illustrations and your captions. Um, you don't necessarily need to index things that are mentioned in passing. Um, basically, you just need to think about what a reader or researcher would find important. Um, Tim Blevins estimates it takes him about six pages an hour when it goes to indexing. Um, it actually took me a little longer than that since this was my first time creating a complete index. Um, it is very time consuming because you're looking at each and every page in your book and determining which words you want to index. Um, and it is subjective and for me that made it take a little longer because there wasn't a right or wrong. So I had to really focus and think um, if I wanted to index a certain word or not. And last, I just want to talk quickly about ordering proofs. Um, you will probably want to do that. I mentioned earlier um, how an image looks on your screen isn't necessarily how it looks when you get a print. Um, and I just wanted to show you an example of that. Uh, on the left-hand side is the first proof of the Big Wigs book that I ordered, and what I was expecting was closer to the fourth proof. And again, on my computer, it looks a little different. So um, basically, you just want to order the books until it looks how you'd like it. It's also a good chance for you to make sure that the layout you created looks correct. Um, and this is something you want to factor in if you have a specific budget to stick to. I ordered, I think, about six proofs. Um, and then you also want to think about this if you have a specific timeline to stick to um, because it takes a lot of time. So you get the proof, you make the adjustments, you order another proof, you have to wait for the proof to come in, et cetera, et cetera, and it keeps going until you're ready. So if you do have a timeline, try and factor in ordering proofs as well. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Tim Morris. He's going to talk about proofreading. And that's something we do um, once the chapters have been put into InDesign and are um, laid out and formatted the way we'd like. OK. So proofreading. Now you've, you've done the editing. You've compiled the book. You've got it in InDesign, if that's what you're using, like we are. Um, now you're into the final stages. Proofreading is going to fit into some of these final stages um, of, of your book. And again, there's advantages to having multiple proofreaders, just like with multiple editors. Um, the more eyes on it, uh, the better. Things are easily overlooked. I'm sure many of you, probably all of you, have cracked open a professionally done 
mass market book and found a number of errors. Um, it's going to happen. Uh, perfection is probably impossible. Um, but you want to try and get as close as you can, so having multiple proofreaders can help. And the focus now is not really the content um, or the um, structure of the book. It's really those minor errors, um, misspellings, grammar, uh, punctuation, etc. So what you're going to be doing now is really narrowing the focus for your proofreaders. And the proofreaders and editors don't have to be the same people. Um, they can be different, uh, different people if, you, if you'd like to use different people, if you have the ability to use different people. <clears throat> so some of the things that help uh, the process for us, in addition to having multiple sets of eyes, is uh, a, a software tool called TextStat. Has anybody heard of TextStat? Well, I'll talk a little bit about that because we found it to be very useful in, uh, in proofreading in finding some of those uh, misspellings and, and, and errors. Um, and then, of course, there are cons to software as well. Your standard spell checker and grammar checker come with some built-in limitations. If you're like me, um, you have kind of a love-hate relationship with uh, computers and software. They're great tools to help us speed things up. It's a much more efficient process than using a typewriter. Um, but, uh, but you can't rely 100% on, uh, on them. There are gremlins that somehow make their way into these things and, and wreak havoc. So spell checkers and grammar checkers, while great tools, um, are not 100% reliable and, and can miss things pretty easily. So here's just kind of a screenshot of TextStat um, when you open it up. And what TextStat does is it'll create a word list of every word used in the book and it'll show the frequency of use in the book. And as you can see, you can export it into a Word file or an Excel file. And so what it'll do, what you'll see um, in, in both of these examples is uh, alphabetical listing of each word, um, and then next to it, the frequency of use. And you can then go in and, and see, uh, oh, okay, so this word should be spelled this way. Um, and this can be really helpful, particularly when you're talking about things that, um, that maybe there isn't a standard spelling for. Surnames are a good example of this. If your uh, person you're talking about is Adams, A-D-A-A-M-S, uh, but you're spelling it A-D-A-M-S, something like that. Easy to miss when you're uh, going through the process of proofreading. Multiple proofreaders can see that and not think twice about it because maybe it's a natural spelling in their mind. But then if you go through it each line by line word, and you can, you can easily pick up on some of these misspellings. So TextStat's a really good tool to, um, to use. And this is a, a free open source uh, program that you can use as well. And, and Tim will mention, um, at some point uh, and at the end of the program here uh, about how to um, find some more resources similar to this. Um, now an example of where this would come in handy uh, in a previous book that we'd released um, that we weren't using TextStat, in one of our headings, in one of our chapters, we'd actually misspelled the word Colorado 20 times, uh, right? And it's in the header. Each proofreader went through, didn't see it. The writer didn't see it. The, uh, the editors didn't see it. Um, and so it made it all the way uh, to printing. And, and so something like text that could really come in handy there because it was just a simple mistake uh, that could easily happen. And uh, so something like this could really help with those uh, common errors. Um, now there's a learning curve to using new software as well. So th these are the kinds of things that you'll want to consider. Um, but um, software can be helpful. Software can also be a hindrance. So things to consider. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim Blevins, who will uh, talk a little bit more about some of the other things to consider. So Tim was very kind when he said, we misspelled Colorado. Uh, I misspelled Colorado. Um, and so TechStat was just an effort to try, to try to figure out how do we stop making these mistakes. I, I don't spell well, I never have, and um, so I, I wanted to try to find something that would help us. When I was in uh, college, um, for college papers, I used to read things upside down, uh, and that would put my brain in a 
place where I wouldn't automatically understand what that word should be spelled like, so I would catch misspellings. Uh, but reading a whole book upside down probably wasn't something I would have time to do. Uh, so with TechStat, uh, and you can find this if you go to our regionalhistoryseries.org website, uh, we have a section called um, Publishing Tips. And there are step-by-step -step instructions on how to use it and the download link. It's actually available at a, a German university where it's developed. Uh, it's in English or German. And um, it, it really is an invaluable tool. It does take, however, me uh, about 10 hours to read every single word carefully um, for a, about a four or 500 page book. So it's, it's time consuming, but I promise you, uh, when I find 40 errors that we've missed, uh, I, that's really time well worth it. So I, I highly recommend it. Uh, also on the regionalhistoryseries.org website, uh, there's a section called writing tips. And this is really, um, these are blogs. And what the source of these um, um, entries are when I'm editing and I get really frustrated that somebody's doing something uh, or not doing something the way I want them to do it. Um, I, I put a blog post in there. And so uh, it's kind of a compilation. It's for me. Uh, and But it also helps uh, others who are providing uh, chapters for our books to kind of know what, what our expectations are. So there's a, there's a lot about citation and, and stuff like that. And then uh, Pikes Peak Library District, this has mentioned, been mentioned earlier, but Writer's Corner. Uh, this is a great resource for programs, uh, databases, local authors, uh, local writing groups. Uh, so if you go there, you can find a lot of information uh, that uh, can be helpful to you. And then also mentioned the um, uh, Creative Computer Commons that's located here at Library 21C. Uh, they have on many of their computers Adobe Creative Cloud, which is the, the suite of software that Adobe makes available that includes InDesign, it includes uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, and other um, software that Adobe makes. So you've already paid for this. Your tax dollars have paid for it. You don't have to go out and buy it. You can use it here at the library. Now, uh, you've heard Heather and Tim talk about the learning curve. And so when we started talking about doing this, um, I really wanted to, well, what does the learning curve look like? I always had an idea. And, and there are different ideas of what learning curves look like. Uh, this one fits me pretty well. Uh, you've got um, proficiency on the vertical axis and, and uh, time and experience on the horizontal axis. And you start out doing something as a novice and you get really excited, oh, I can do this. And then you kind of plummet and you drop into this valley and you realize, I don't know what I don't know. Um, that's where a few things happen. Um, for some of us, we give up, we just don't go any further. Uh, or for some of us, that's where we ask for help or realize we need to get somebody else uh, involved. And um, you don't have to be an expert to do it yourself published. You don't have to reach the top. You just have to get up on that, that slope. Now, there are some resources here at the library that uh, can help you get out of that trough. Um, and these are subscription databases, or resources rather, that uh, again, your taxpayer dollars have paid for these. One is Universal Class. And this gives you uh, basically instruction on how to use InDesign. Now, it's a little dated in that it's uh, showing you how to use InDesign um, CS4, uh, which is uh, an older version, but um, it, it's, uh, it's methodical, and most of the principles you would learn in that version four, you can apply to version six in the Creative Cloud. Now, lynda.com is another one you may have heard of, and uh, this gives you um, very, very detailed information on uh, many aspects of uh, InDesign uh, version six. And uh, those pretty well directly apply to uh, the Creative Cloud. And what's nice about uh, Linda, if you search InDesign, you will get over 5,000 lessons uh, in, in, in lynda.com for just InDesign. But these are short, five minute, 10 minute. Uh, so if you're looking for something very specific, how do I do this? Uh, lynda.com is probably a really good choice for that. Uh, of course, there's always YouTube. Um, I, I 
think most of us use YouTube for some sort of how do I do this. You just have to be kind of careful about uh, wasting your time. I mean, the, the quality of instruction can vary quite a bit. And so um, uh, you just want to make sure that uh, you're um, uh, learning something that's actually useful to you. Now, we talked about the software that we use, which is basically Microsoft Word and InDesign. Uh, there are lots of different softwares available. Uh, what we did here today was just kind of give you an overview of what we do. Um, some of the software I'm starting to use in the, one of the books that I'm working on, uh, I decided I want to produce a book using entirely open source free software. Um, and that's a lot harder than I thought it would be to do. Open source free software. The question was, what is open source free software? Free means you don't have to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and a lot of it might, uh, you may, may, may be something donations are solicited and such. But open source is software that is um, available for anybody to actually get into the nuts and bolts of the programming and they can actually alter it and um, create a new product from that. So uh, it's not, not all free software is open source. Um, but that's what I wanted to do. And so we're looking at uh, three different softwares that I'm, we're using for one book that we're publishing. It's a reprint of uh, the book of Colorado Springs by Manly Orms and Eleanor Orms, his wife. Um, and so we're using LibreOffice, which is kind of an equivalent to Microsoft Word. Um, we're using LaTeX. It's also called, pronounced LaTeX, but it's spelled LaTeX. Um, I warn you to be very careful if you're searching images for um, uh, LaTeX in Google, uh, you might get surprises. Um, and then Scribus or Scribus, a lot of these names uh, are difficult to pronounce because uh, the, the, they can be pronounced many ways. That Scribus is very similar to InDesign in that it is um, uh, a graphic uh, design software. Uh, LaTeX is very dissimilar. It is a command-based design software. So at LaTeX, actually, you can program in a text editor. That's what I'm doing. And then you compile it using a LaTeX uh, software package. Um, it's designed for scientists and, and uh, mathematicians. Uh, so you can imagine it's, it's kind of challenging to to, to use if you have a humanities uh, background. Um, but it actually, that challenge is, is kind of invigorating. And so uh, it's fun to, to learn something new. And so it's one of a, our, our new projects. But there, there are lots of other software products available. Now, there's some other considerations that when you're getting ready to do, do it yourself, um, are you going to be doing a print book? Or are you going to be doing an e-book? Are you going to be doing both? Uh, we do both. And using InDesign, uh, you can produce an EPUB format, which is the most common format for um, electronic books. It is not seamless. Um, uh, Heather could attest that you can output to EPUB from InDesign, but there are many, many hours of work and redesign uh, for the EPUB version. So it's, uh, we're not there yet in just clicking a button and producing an EPUB from um, a book design. Um, and then there are other softwares involved in that, which we'll, um, uh, we won't go into those, but um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty involved process. Uh, Is there So the question is, is there something that helps you uh, with EPUB after you've exported it from InDesign? Uh, the answer is yes. Now let's see if I can remember what it is. Um, do you remember, Heather? It'll come to me in just a minute. But yeah, there's a software. It's also um, an open source. Well, it may not be open source, but it's free. And it's one that we use. And so we'll, we'll figure that out for you. Um, so distribution channels. Um, I told you we do, we're not terribly concerned about selling our books, but we, we do sell our books. Uh, some of them we feel have sold quite well. Others not as well. Our, probably our best selling book, we've sold over 3,000 copies. And for a niche market, that's not too bad. Uh, and those are print copies. Um, Ebook format, um, maybe a few hundred copies of the same title. And it's a, a much smaller percentage. Um, but when you're considering uh, 
working with uh, different organizations or businesses rather who are uh, going to distribute you, your book, you want to kind of know, well, I want it to be on Amazon, I want it to be on Kobo, I want it to be on Barnes & Noble, and kind of have an idea, and then these uh, uh, different companies will help you make those connections. Uh, marketing promotion, I think, has been pretty well covered, that these uh, things are pretty much on your own, and uh, if you want your book to be successful, uh, you really need to um, uh, take it seriously and, and get out there and promote it. Uh, just publishing it won't make it successful. So there are dozens and dozens and dozens of companies that will help you produce books, either print or ebook or both. Um, some of these um, will do absolutely everything for you. you they'll make all of those uh, distribution channels, uh, con connections for you. Uh, you. You just have to give them your manuscript, give them some money. And uh, they'll take care of all of the editing, the layout, uh, everything that you need. Uh, some of these others are, are um, all they do is print. So um, you, you need to do a little research to determine what your goals are and what you would like to accomplish, and then figure out which one of the, the many, 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 far more than these uh, companies uh, can meet your needs. The best way to actually identify that, in my opinion, is to talk to each other, uh, find out who you have used, and if you've had success uh, in doing so. Now, by now you might decide, you know, doing it myself is really overwhelming. Uh, there's too much here. I, I'm a writer. I'm not interested in becoming a publisher. And, and that's okay. That's why we're doing this. Um, one resource I can point you to is the Colorado Independent Publishers Association. And they have a services directory on their website and uh, these are local people who will do virtually all of these parts for you. And I know there's some people here who uh, also uh, will assist you in, in doing your publishing. And you can raise your hands, that's okay. A little self-promotion is okay, cool. So those people who are raising your hands, those are local people who can help you accomplish these goals. And um, so you don't, you don't have to do all of this work yourself. So basically you can choose an a la carte kind of approach where you pick and choose the companies you work with, uh, you, or you can use a turnkey approach. Uh, some companies, they do it all for you. Now I would advise you to read and understand all of the terms of service if, if there are any. If you're working with a printer, you, there may not be any kind of terms of service. You, you upload your book or you go to your local printer and um, they give you your product. Uh, I, do, I did have an experience with an online printer. Uh, this is several years ago. Uh, they did have terms of service. It was multiple pages. And I read every line. Uh, all they were doing was printing a book for me. And, but there was one line that said they were retaining performance rights to the book that we were providing. And uh, so I, I contacted and I said, well, why are you retaining this performance right? Oh, don't worry about that. Uh, we wouldn't bother doing that. Well, if you're having me sign an agreement that says you, you're taking this right, that gives you the right to do that, and we chose not to do business with them. Uh, so do take those agreements seriously. And I've got a, a rule of thumb. Uh, if you read out loud the, you, the uh, agreement, and if you have to take more than one breath when you read a sentence, uh, you probably maybe want to talk to somebody uh, like an attorney uh, because uh, those agreements are complicated and uh, you really want to know what you're getting into if you're, you're, if you're giving up some of your rights. And again, if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. Um, the, the whole reason to do this is, be, is to enjoy yourself doing and enjoy doing it. And um, so if you saw anything here today that would spark your enthusiasm, yes, this looks like something I want to try. Well, that's great. And the library is here to help you achieve those goals. But if it's just like, I don't want to do that, that's cool too. Uh, there are people who can help you achieve those goals. Thank you, Richard. I was surprised that 
So the question is, uh, is there support available here at the library if you want to produce an audio version of your book? The answer is yes. Um, there's a sound booth um, with equipment, uh, and there's training involved so that you can learn how to operate the equipment. And so, absolutely, those are new services that are provided here. So, great question. We have we did one uh, audio version of a book that we published. Uh, it was an experience we will never do again. Uh, I mean, the product was great. We we we'd like trying new things, and um, it, we just learned that that it was a lot more work than we expected it would be. And because we try to set a pretty high standard for ourselves and want something professional quality, um, don't let that discourage you. So, great question. Yes. traditional publisher. So the question was, if you're self-published, can you also get published by a traditional publisher? I think the panel earlier, uh, which you may not have been here for, uh, mentioned that that is a possibility. Um, but um, I guess what I came away with is um, you really have to be successful at self-publishing to get that book taken on by a traditional publisher. Would that be a fair assessment, Peg? I guess you could guess. So. So the, the, the answer to your question is yes, but it, it may be an exception than, than the rule. Good question. Thank you. Are there any other questions, or are you all hungry? So, okay. Well, thank you so much. I think the refreshments are ready.